the thought of these horses part wild being shipped to Alexandria boggles the mind really. And then of course the minute they got landed all the horses wanted to do was bolt and the last seen disappearing. And so the Australian Imperial Force developed these remount units. One is led by celebrated bush poet, Major Banjo Patterson. Australia had been scoured to find a couple of hundred rough riders, possibly the best lot of men that were ever got together to deal with rough horses. They decided to give the war a fly. Banjo Patterson, Major, second remount. Great horsemen do a remarkable job in getting hardly broken horses, trained and combat ready in a matter of months. One of them was called Bill, and he was a bastard of a horse. He used to pig rude, he used to buck people off, just impossible to ride. He was 17.1 hands, that's five foot nine at the shoulder. I mean, he's like a tall rhinoceros. And he behaved like one. Grandfather heard about him, being what we call these days a, a horse whisperer, I guess. He went down and he used to go up and talk to the horse. He used to run his hands over him, he used to bag him. And he'd do this every time he got a spare moment. And eventually, uh, Bill uh, allowed him to get up on him. He pig rooted, he, he bucked a bit, and Granddad stayed with him. And from then on, that was his horse. As the fighting continues through the night, the Australians suffer heavy losses. The Turkish army advances to within a kilometre of Romney. Then, with the battle in the balance, an Australian legend is born. In the middle of the battle of Romani was Bill the Bastard. Even with Grandad on, he'd give a bit of a shy and a buck before they went into battle. And he was Shanahan under orders, going up and down the lines, keeping his men in it. Now, to get the idea of the energy, the drive, the power of this horse, he went five or six hours running, and other horses were lasting 30 minutes. As the fighting with Bills continue, four men find themselves stranded with their horses dead. That horse, Bill, and my grandfather, they were one. They didn't have time to think about fear or, or how tough the job was. He'd only need to put his hand on that horse's neck and that horse knew exactly what to do. Bill's ears lay back and he'd charge in. Shanahan said, get up on Bill, get up. One in each stirrup, two on the back, we'll get out. <laughs> Bill, this horse that no one could ride three months earlier, took the five men out and they got out and back to Romany. Shanahan went back into battle for another hour and a half and that's when Shanahan was badly wounded in that case. Fortunately, uh, somewhere in the melee he was shot on the left leg went on fighting, collapsed on the horse, and Bill did an amazing thing. Bill very gently got back to the base. Now, had it been a frightened horse, he might have galloped and he would have been thrown off, but he was definitely saving his life by taking him back. It was really a duality. They were a team. And this is why there was a terrific affinity between the horses and the troopers. In some way, their lives were saved by the horse at some point.
and it is their horses' rugged breeding that carries them on. This is an account from an English cavalry man. Indeed, the hardships endured by these horses was almost incredible. They carried the soldier, the saddle, ammunition, sword, rifle, clothes, on half rations and only one drink in every 36 hours. It is no doubt these Australian horses make the finest cavalry mounts in the world. By the end of the year, they're on the frontier of the Ottoman Empire. They're ready for an offensive war and they come against probably the greatest defensive line the Turks have been able to create, beginning with Gaza on the coast and stretching inland almost as far as the water wells of Beersheba. Gaza was the big block. If you didn't take Gaza, the war's in stalemate. Even though you've cleared them out of the Sinai, you're not going to take Palestine if you haven't got Gaza. The sheer impetus of this heaving, charging, galloping mass on a terrified enemy took over and it had its own momentum. You have a large number of men galloping down at you very quickly. You're firing back but you're not necessarily seeing much result for that fire. And that is one of the reasons why cavalry charges are called shock action. Childhood companions Guy and Midnight lie wounded struck by the same bullet, while their comrades sweep forward to victory. And that's where Beersheba enters Australian legend, and they capture the wells intact, and the town falls. The casualties are not light. The horses must have sensed fear and noise and confusion but they had the faith in the men that were on their backs and they rode across that beaten ground and they took that position they got to perform under fire don't they and the carriage was there they are a unique horse put your life on them and they'll get you home <laughs> it was an extraordinary feat of arms i believe that it's one of the great cavalry charges of all time it is the last stand for one of the greatest empires in history. So you're dealing with 100,000 soldiers on the enemy side and you've got to really be tactically brilliant to win this. What he wants to do is to swing from the Jordan Valley back to the coast, across the plains of Sharon and advance through Megiddo, across the biblical battlefield of Armageddon and draw down on Damascus. General Allenby concentrates his forces near the ancient fort of Megiddo. It is the path taken by the great invading armies of yesteryear. The plan is to pound a hole in the Turkish line, then exploit it with what has become the British Empire's secret weapon. Men on horseback. Australian airmen and British airmen knock out the lines of communication behind the Turkish lines. The British launch an infantry breakthrough, driving one Turkish army back along the coast while leaving the others in situation. A gap occurs between these two Turkish armies and his mounted soldiers ride through that gap. They swing around behind the Turkish troops that are still in contact, cutting off a massive number of Turkish soldiers. I've seen the German cables. They'd say, the Anzacs will go where no man or horse should go. They are madmen. The Australians and the British mounted soldiers are advancing faster than the enemy can retreat. The Turkish coordination starts to fall apart. The Megiddo Offensive is a truly remarkable military feat. 
an astounding victory. It destroys three Ottoman armies and ultimately it results in an exploitation that pushes well beyond what anyone had ever hoped. Harry Chevelle chose the 10th Light Horse for the Damascus. And he said categorically it's because of what happened at the Neck. You deserve the honour of taking the town of Damascus. As the 10th readies itself, chaos erupts inside the city. The Turkish forces are in disarray. They knew that the British were coming. That's those inside Damascus. So the Turks and the Germans were going to get out. To the west of Damascus is the Barada Gorge, one of the main routes out of the city. So they were taking trains, they're taking any vehicle, they hood horses and everything through that gorge. The light horse have this covered from on high. Remember, these are blokes, six bullets, six kills. All can shoot. And the Turks were going to surrender smartly, I thought, but the German commander said, no, you fight the last man. Every living thing was slaughtered in that gorge that night. Allenby sends in the Australian light horse to skirt around the town to make sure the Turks have gone and to make sure that there's some order so that the Arab army can successfully consolidate the city. It's led by a major named Olden. He was a very keen horseman. My mum and my dad, they had a horse that they named Pi in memory of grandfather's horse who went into Damascus that day. And he's weaving his way with these soldiers behind him through these chaotic tiny little streets, but they keep bumping into these slums and these tiny little blind alleys. Not the sort of place you can take men and horses. And so he gets edged closer to the centre of town. He knows he's not supposed to get there, but he can't find another way through the city. And suddenly, there he and his men are, formed up on the square in front of the Great Sarai, the great town hall and meeting place in the centre of the oldest city on earth. He's covered in dust. He's got his revolver in one hand. He is not sure what he's supposed to do. He's not supposed to have an official function. This is supposed to be Faisal and Lawrence of Arabia. Well, this is my grandfather's book. The officers advanced, halted in the center of the room and called for the governor to approach. Alden asked, does the city surrender? Yes, there will be no further opposition in the city. He gets the surrender in writing. He holds up the piece of paper to his men. They can all hear him. And he says, I'm in the line of Ramesses II of Egypt, Alexander the Great of Greece, and Napoleon of France in the surrender of Damascus. He was taking the mickey, of course. And there's a huge roar from the men, because they know Alden. He's a bit of an eccentric, but he knows his history. And it's interesting that he got them to write out the surrender, so he'd have it forever, to say, well, we were first in, not Lawrence and the Arabs, and here it is, here's the piece of paper. So this is the original document surrendering the city of Damascus to, uh, to Alden. And it reads, I have the greatest honour in meeting Major Arthur Alden, who was the first British officer to enter Damascus, in the bravest manner known of the Saxon race. I have written these words as remembrance of this glorious meeting, signed by Amir Muhammad Sayyid, son of Emir Ali, son of Amir Abdul Qadir. It must have been a remarkable scene for these men and horses that have been on campaign for years, being presented with the keys to the older city. And of course, it's indicative of what a citizen's army the AIF is. Olden is a dentist from Narragin in Western Australia. Two hours later, Lawrence arrives in a Rolls Royce to officially accept the surrender of Damascus for the record books. 
By now, the Australians have raced forward on their great ride, sweeping their enemy north and driving home the long campaign's most important victory. The greatest cavalry feat in British military history, the great drive that went so far, so fast, and was so devastating to their enemy, was the crowning achievement. Then, on the 11th of November, 1918, the armistice is announced. The war in Europe and in the Middle East is over. The Australians have forced the Turkish army back to less than 50 kilometres from their homeland. The Ottoman Empire is in ruins. Forged under fire, the incredible partnership between the men and the horses of the Australian Mounted Division has achieved greatness. It's open lands, desert, classical history, stories popping up from the Bible. Australia had the potential to show the capacity of their bushmen, their uh, love with their horses, their steadiness. It's a perfect story. The horses were paramount in winning the Desert War, and if they came out with glory, it was because of the horse. Years of conflict finally over, that bond faces a new challenge. They often said my best mate was the horse, and they all dreamt of going back to their towns and riding down the main street victorious. Hard economics will soon shatter that dream. At the end of the war, the equipment needed to be either recycled or destroyed. And the horses fell into that equation. It's a sad thing, but the war is not only war, it's probably a business as well at the end of the day. They'd done their job and uh, they left them there. Although the price of going to war had never mattered, the cost of coming home now does. The emotional investment between man and horse, years of campaigning together, is suddenly going to end. All the horses are classified. The fit and young will be sold to the British and Indian armies. But soldiers fear some may be sold on. They did not want to see proud Australian war horses being treated the way that farm animals were in the Middle East. It was very tragic after what these horses had meant to these soldiers and to think that the government would not help them out and bring these horses home. I think they felt very let down, yes, at the end of the war by that. In some cases, they took the law into their own hands. Peter Hayden's other great uncle, Barney, has survived this horse polo to the very end. He now faces a terrible decision. Along with others, he chooses to take one last unofficial ride. Barney, he would have ridden out on his horse polo. Very upsetting and a very emotional time, no doubt. saddle and their bridle and hand that back in and there's no way they were going to hand their horse back in. They had nightmares for the rest of their life of that moment where they shot the horse, it hit the sand and the relationship was broken. To this day it is unclear just how many men make this choice. I've found very few instances where diggers just took Nettie over the sand dune and put a bullet through the poor steed's head. For many, there is no point to intervening in this way. Classed as too old or unfit for sale, the fate of their horses is already sealed. 
the melancholy information came to hand that the time was drawing near when we were to be finally separated from our beloved horses. We were now to experience the heart-rending business of hearing the death sentence pronounced by the veterinary officers upon so many noble animals, which had, through the trials and triumphs of the long campaign, grown to be part and parcel of our very lives. It was a, a highly organised event. It was done en masse by units. After the horses were classified by the veterinary officers to be destroyed, the horses were taken away from the camps. Their manes and tails were shorn because that was horsehair and horsehair was a commodity, you could get money for it. The horses were then shot under the supervision of a veterinary officer by the working parties working for them. The horses were skinned because the skin was also a commodity and the carcasses were left where they were in the desert to be picked over by scavengers. To me, the most cruel part was having to lead them through the dead to be shot themselves. Don't tell me the horses didn't know what was going to happen to them. Trooper Bostock, 10th Light Horse.